for that, and it's a joy to be close to you, and we appreciate so much Jack and Lana. They just always bring joy to us. We, it's wonderful to be with the two of them, and, and then the whole family. We just love them so much. And then to come and be with you, too, and all the wonderful good things that, that you do to help any time we've come to help in the lectureship or meetings or anything of that nature. We just appreciate it so much. And uh, what great joy it is to be with you again and to see so many of you tonight who may be from a different congregation or are able to come over. I will stamp your letter for you so that you don't get in trouble going home. Well, you might get in trouble anyway, but... We've been asked tonight to deal with this evening with the topic, Bringing Joy in Heaven. And our particular text that we've been given was found in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. You might want to turn over there. The conclusion of that in verse 7 where Jesus said that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. I want us to begin tonight by looking at the context of Jesus' statement. You know, as we think about chapter 15, Luke chapter 15, that's a very familiar, one of the most famous chapters in all the New Testament because we immediately recognize there we find three of the most well-known parables that Jesus gave. The parables deal with the lost sinner. But not only that, also the great love of God in seeking and receiving the lost sinner when the sinner repents and returns home. We can't forget that as we study this. So keep that in mind. This first parable, the one that we've been given where we find this saying of the lost sheep in the wilderness of the world. Let's look at our context right there in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. There we find in verses 1 through 3, and it's important to recognize the setting here. Then drew, uh, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying... So get the context here. We have a group here. In fact, the first group that is mentioned there are the, are the publicans and the sinners. They had come to hear Him. But of course, then we recognize right off the bat, they're not the only ones there. For there we also read about the Pharisees and the scribes are there as well. But then again in verse 4, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it. So we find four points, I believe, here that we're going to draw out of that one verse. We're going to look at the fact that the sheep was lost. We're going to speculate just a little bit on why or how the sheep was lost, probably because of itself. We're going to look at the fact that the sheep was lost where? And then we're going to look at the fact that the sheep was sought until found. Now look at verses 5 and 6. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. The sheep once found brought some great joy to the shepherd, to his friends and neighbors. And then in verse 7, Jesus said, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. The sheep represented a repentant sinner. And Jesus said, which brings great joy in heaven. You know, I like that word, and every time I run across this word, I always stop and, and think about the importance of it. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, and the word is the word likewise. 
And normally when I think of the word likewise, I immediately think of 1 Peter chapter 3 because it's mentioned there a couple of times and it's important to understand the, the importance of the word likewise. What's it talking about? Because of what's already been said, likewise, so it's important to get the comparison there. And here's one of the places I find it the best. In 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, and of course, the verses are supplied by man to help us in our study and memorization and things like that. After saying what he just said, he said, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Listen, wives will not understand that verse until they find out what is the likewise about. What do you mean likewise? Well, when you read up just a little bit, you read how Jesus was subject to God the Father Himself. Jesus, the Son of God. God Himself. And yet He was subject to God the Father in all things. And then Peter says, Likewise, you wives. You see, wives, it doesn't matter how great or, or not so great your husband may be. It's not dependent upon him of how you are to behave and how you are to act to your husband. It's because of what Jesus did. Likewise, you wives be in subjection. You know, sometimes wives will say, well, if my husband will do this or my husband will do that, that's not what Jesus did. And that's what the likewise is about. But not only that, we don't have to look very far until we get to verse 7. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Well, as long as my wife is what she's supposed to be, then I'll be what I'm supposed to be. No, it doesn't matter what your wife does. Likewise still goes back to what Jesus did. Not what your wife does, nor what your husband does. It goes back to the submission that you find in Jesus Christ. I like that word likewise. Every time I see that, I have to go back and see what it's discussing. And that's exactly what we find in our text. When Jesus said, I say unto you, that likewise joy. Likewise what? Likewise, the way this this shepherd who lost something very valuable to him and went to great lengths to find it, and once he find it, he rejoiced because of that. Now likewise. Likewise, there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Let's get our let's get our group of people again. Who he's talking about? He says the tax collectors, the sinners drew near to Jesus for to hear him. Do you think maybe they were just curious? I think there may have been more than that, but that's speculation on my part, I believe these people would be seeking something. I mean, just think of who these people are. Just think about their state and and how they're living. The tax collectors, the publicans. Remember, they worked for the Roman governors who had defeated or conquered Israel. They were considered traitors to both Israel and to God. And no doubt, perhaps many of them would would feather their nests by charging more taxes. The people would hate them. And so they were despised by the people. They were cut off. They were shut out by the religious leaders. And remember who else is in that audience? The scribes and the Pharisees. And then it mentions the sinners, the immoral, the unjust, who did not keep the law of God, such as in Matthew 21, 32. We're going to look at that in a little bit. But right now, I'll just mention it. The harlots, the liars, the thieves, the murderers, all of these were sinners, traitors to both God and man, and they knew it. So when Christ came along preaching what? Christ preaches deliverance from sin, the hope of the kingdom of God. Why would these kind of people come to hear Him? I can't help but think in my own mind out of a spiritual need, a need for deliverance, a need for hope of some kind to hear this message 
of salvation. I mentioned Matthew 21, 32. Jesus said there that the publicans and the harlots would go into the kingdom before those religionists, the, the, the scribes and Pharisees. Why? Because the publicans and harlots would hear the message and would repent and would turn to God. Whereas these great religious people did not feel they had the need. And they would not turn. You know, the attitudes of these scribes and Pharisees was tragic indeed. Here they are, people coming to come to hear Jesus. And there are actually people there who are grumbling against Jesus because He associated with, He would eat with such terrible sinners. Have you ever thought about how it might be in some places if certain people were to come and hear the messages that come out of this very pulpit, and yet anybody would ever come and somebody would think, and think in their mind at least, what are they doing here? Friends, whenever we have an attitude like that, we have the same attitude the scribes and Pharisees had. And we must not let that happen. They felt it was beneath the dignity of any respectable person to have anything, to associate with these vile sinners in any way. And I want us to note something here. I believe this is really important. Christ was not of the world, but He was out in the world trying to reach men for God. I hope you can see the difference. Just like you, I know what, what Paul wrote in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians chapter six, seventeen and eighteen, and I want to adhere to this too. As Christians, we're to come out from among them, the worldly. Come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you and be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. We're not to be of the world with sinners out doing worldly things and carrying on worldly conversations. Ephesians 4 and verse 29, No corrupt communication ought to ever proceed out of our mouth. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6, Let our speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Instead, we are to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every sinner. As believers, we must be willing to, to go. We must not sit back and expect people to come to us. And so with this background in mind, here's the sinners, the publicans, coming to Jesus, and perhaps, just perhaps, their hearts were such that they wanted to hear Maybe for the first time. Maybe thinking in their own minds, I never have a chance. I never have any hope. Maybe just to hear some, some thoughts of deliverance and salvation from this man, according to them. Here's the Pharisees and the scribes. They're grumbling and complaining. And yet Christ answers their grumblings with three great parables. And it's in this first parable, and we'll see also a part of it leaking on over into the second parable as well, where our topic for our lesson has been given. You know, I gave you a little four points in verse 4. Let's look at those just a moment, and maybe we can get a, a broader picture of what's going on here in verse 4. First of all, we mention the sheep was lost. The sheep represents perhaps two different people here. I see the sheep representing perhaps the unbeliever. Those are the ones who are there who came to hear Him. The unbelievers. Or maybe it's the sinner that wanders out into the wilderness of the world. The person who goes astray. They're there, but then they go astray. And they're lost to God. And the word there is apolumai, which means to perish, to destroy, to lose, to lose eternal life to be spiritually destitute, to be cut off. The sheep is lost. 
We may ask the question, though, secondly, well, how was this sheep lost? And we don't know. It, it doesn't tell us. But He does give us the figure of the sheep. Uh, I would spend time with my uncle in West Texas, and though we mostly worked cattle, there was a lot of sheep in that part too. And I remember the first time going out, and, and my uncle said, okay, get on this horse and, and help get those sheep in that pen. Well, I like, just like the cattle, I got on the horse and got right behind them, and I was yawning and yin and everything, and those sheep weren't going anywhere because you don't drive sheep. I didn't know that. But there are things you find out about sheep. And you find about how aimless they are. So here's this lamb. The answer is probably because of self. Maybe the sheep got attracted by something out there in the, in the wilderness. That's where they are. Out in the wilderness, away from the flock of the, of the shepherd, he sees something out there. Maybe that gets his attention. And maybe he starts meandering that direction. What the sheep sees is, is perhaps more attractive, more appealing, maybe a different color shade of grass. He wants to try that out. We don't know why. But why was he lost? You think the shepherd got him out of there? No. Shepherd would not have done that. You think the other sheep kind of started a little wall there and, and kept them butted out there? No, we don't read anything like that. Probably, just probably... Because that's what sheep do sometimes. Aimlessly just wander off. Maybe something that tempted it. Maybe something that seduced it. Maybe something out, some kind of desire off to the side. And we think about 1 John 2 and verse 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. As we talk about humans and not sheep. Then probably the sheep is, like I said, aimless, not paying any attention to what's going on, just kind of aimlessly wanders off. Oh, there's a blade of grass, there's a blade of grass, there's another one, there's another one. And, and just continues on wandering off, getting lost. And the sheep does not know that it's losing its way. Sheep is already lost, perhaps when it discovers there's no other sheep around. Maybe the sheep refused to heed the warning of the shepherd. That's certainly possible. Maybe it refused to heed the example of the rest of the flock. That's certainly uh, an idea. The pride of life, as far as humans would be concerned, 1 John 2 and verse 16. And just maybe the sheep is not attached enough to the shepherd or to the other sheep. You ever think about that? I'll never forget hearing the story of a man who had done a lot of study in this regard with shepherds and sheep and, and things like that. And he had mentioned one time, and, and I'll never forget the, the picture that he painted of the shepherd with his crook. Now, I don't know how you picture the crook, but the way he was picturing, a lot of times the crook would have a big old half circle on the end of it. And used for a lot of reasons, and he... He went through all of it, all the things that could be done with that part of the, of the staff. And he said that sometimes in, in that area of the world where there's lots of sheep and shepherds, that the, uh, if the shepherd had a lamb, that every time it, it was down on the ground somewhere, it would just run off. And he'd have to go off and, and grab that and bring it back and go off. And after a few times... He said sometimes that shepherd would take that, that, that staff with a hook on it and reach down underneath that lamb's feet and just give it a big jerk and break a leg. What are you talking about? Why would a shepherd break the leg of the lamb? And then he would dress it and he would carry that, that lamb maybe in the fold of his garment somehow in his arm, and he'd carry that lamb everywhere it went until that leg mended. And when he let the, la the lamb down, that lamb would not run off again. He had something there, a connection with the shepherd. Maybe this one didn't. Or the great example of the other sheep that are all right there together, staying together, not wandering off. Who knows? There's maybe perhaps not the bond or the union there should be between this lamb 
and the shepherd are this lamb and the other sheep. And you know, when we think about it from a human standpoint, isn't that the way it usually is? People who may be in the church, and yet at times find themselves away from the Lord, away from His church. There's not the, the union, the bond that ought to be there. I think about Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. and You know, as preachers, we've used that verse, uh, especially 25, hundreds of times, I know. But there's a whole lot more there than just make sure you assemble. And don't you forsake the assembly. There's a whole lot more there. In verse 24, And let us consider one another to love and to good works. Is that what you're doing? Oh yes, we've got to assemble together. That's what he's going to continue on by saying. And we do that, and while we do that, what we're doing when we do that, we're considering one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Sometimes we just get together to provoke one another. But we are to provoke unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the custom of some is but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. You know, maybe, just maybe, this sheep did not trust the shepherd. Maybe he didn't think it was going to feed it properly. and Maybe he thought there would be greener pasture somewhere. Or maybe some different kind of satisfying food somewhere. This is how the sheep could have, and I say could have, been lost. We're not sure. But the question can arise also, where was the sheep lost? You say, well, in the wilderness. Yeah, but as we read that, it said that all the sheep were in the wilderness. Yes, it did. It does. But the other sheep were in the wilderness under the care of the shepherd. There's the important part. Yes, they may have all been in the wilderness, but the ninety and nine are in the care of the shepherd. Imagine what it would be like in the wilderness without the care of the shepherd. You see what we're talking about. We're not talking about sheep. We're talking about us. We're talking about the church. We're talking about our shepherds. Out there in the world, without the care of shepherds, you know, people sometimes want to argue about the idea of placing membership. I don't know why you got to place membership and all that. To be under the care of shepherds. Because it's a terrible world out there. How much easier, how much better it would be if you're under the care of the shepherd. The wilderness had an excitement about it. There's the unknown. There's the risk out there. But once the sheep ventured out into the wilderness without the shepherd's care, think what it must have been like. The rugged terrain, full of narrow ridges and deep ravines and crevices. The shepherd would have guided them away from all of that stuff, but he doesn't have the shepherd's care anymore. And he's out there in this, in this wilderness. The rough going, the heavy, thick underbrush, the pricking, piercing thorns, the dangerous footing. And if he doesn't find his way out very soon, he's eventually going to be lost forever. You see the shepherd's care? You know, this world attracts people. It attracts all of us. So much that it has to offer, it says. Occupation and purpose, sure. Position, image, lifestyle and acceptance, plenty and wealth, ego and self-esteem, opportunity and satisfaction, recognition and privilege, authority and power, and more and more and more. And yet the Bible warns us, has already been mentioned in this series, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 
It's a dangerous world out there. And without the care of shepherds, we would be lost. Note also, the sheep was sought until it was found. Four things. The lost sheep was sought, verse 4. Sometimes people get the idea that why would a shepherd leave 99 and go find this one? Because the 99 were in a safe place. They were in the sheepfold. He had seen to that. He had taken care of that. But there was one that needed his attention. And he would seek that one. As long as that sheep was lost, seeking it was his primary purpose and reason of the shepherd. Shepherds, you think about that for just a moment. This search was urgent. You think he thought, well, you know, in a couple of weeks I'm going to go out looking for that sheep. You don't get that picture, do you? He went after the one lost sheep as though it was the only one. The shepherd's dedication, his commitment to doing what? Seeking this lost sheep. Thirdly, the shepherd sought until he found the sheep. He did not seek complacently or slowly. He recognized the urgency in it, and he would not give up until he found the sheep. You think about that. Think about the, despite the difficulties of, the rough terrain he must have had to go through to try to find the sheep, the weariness of long hours, the tediousness of going down one, one road that was dead end and another one then that was dead end. Surely he did all of that. But he sought and he kept on seeking until he found the lost sheep. He never gave up. And fourthly, when the shepherd found the sheep, he embraced the sheep. He threw it over his shoulders. He received it with arms wide open, open, embracing it, rejoicing in heart, supporting it and carrying it home. Verse 6. Doesn't that sound like Isaiah chapter 53, 4-6? Surely hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted, but He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to His own way, and the Lord had laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Psalm 119, 176, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek Thy servant, for I do not forget Thy commandments. What happened once the sheep was found? It brought great joy. Note what the shepherd did. He called all his neighbors, his friends, together. He wanted everyone to know that the lost sheep, it's been found. Everyone had been concerned, perhaps, praying, hoping, waiting. They wanted to join in the rejoicing. Everyone rejoiced. Because the shepherd's labor was not in vain, was it? He found the sheep. And the shepherd tenderly called the lost sheep, what? My sheep. My sheep which was lost. It was his. No matter how dirty it was, filthy, unclean, destitute, depraved, ugly, or lost it had been, it was still his Sheep that had been lost. Yes, it can be lost. But it can be found. Let me ask you, who was it that God sent to seek the lost? Did He send one of His angels as a servant? No. He sent His own Son to seek the lost. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of God Himself came to seek. So in this parable, 
Who represents the sheep? Those who had drawn near to hear His words of deliverance and salvation? The publicans, the sinners? I mentioned to you before, Matthew 21, 31-32. You remember the context there? Jesus told the parable about the two sons. Son, go do this. He said, I will not, but he repented and he went. The other son, yes, I will, but he didn't. And Jesus asked the question there, whether of them twain did the will of the Father. And they say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots, they believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. He represents a penitent sinner. And when the sinner repents, what does Jesus say in verse 7? I say unto you that likewise, remember the scene, causes friends and neighbors, they're rejoicing. Jesus said likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. You know, I, I, I completely admit, the only joy I know is right here on this earth. And I mentioned something that brings us joy, and there are many things that bring you joy as well. And I think about the joy. I have to admit, I don't know the level. I can't even fathom the level of the joy the Bible talks about that's in heaven. I, I just get overwhelmed just thinking about it. Yeah, I can think about the joy that we have from time to time. I still don't see that anywhere near the kind of joy there must be in heaven. In verse 10, he said, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. These were, this was not about sheep and coins, was it? It's about sinners that repent. Ezekiel 18.21, But if the wicked will turn from his sins, then he hath, that he hath committed and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. And Isaiah 55.7, Let the wicked forsake his way, the, uh, the unrighteous man his thoughts, And let him return unto the Lord, and he'll have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Is that grounds of rejoicing? I can can only consider what's said. The joy that shall be in heaven. The joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Scribes and Pharisees never learned the lesson that Jesus taught them. Going back to Luke chapter 5, 31 and 32, Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus tries to teach them through these lost parables to repent. And to those who, who, who have repented, show compassion for them. Show joy over the fact that they have repented and returned. Who rejoices in heaven? Several of our lessons have already been about heaven. Going to heaven. Who's in heaven? God is in heaven. Jesus the Son is in heaven. The angels are in heaven. The Holy Spirit's in heaven. And when the Bible tells us there's joy in the presence of the angels, there's joy in heaven. Who's there to rejoice? God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the angels in heaven. As I close, I want to I want to bring this home. I want to bring this to us tonight. And I ask you to think very seriously. You realize that tonight, right now, this evening, we can bring joy. In heaven. I mean, God, 
Christ our Savior, the Holy Spirit, the angels in heaven rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents and returns home. Joy in heaven. How about it, friend? Maybe someone here tonight needs to come home. You know, we all know how it is. You were right there one time. You were with all the others, tending, singing praises, working in the church. We all know how this is. But our eyes begin to be focused on something else. Something else gets our attention. Perhaps, like the sheep, aimlessly. You just begin to be moving in that direction until one day you look up and everything you knew, everybody you associated with is gone. Where are you? Sometimes we can't even recognize we're back in the world. It wasn't everybody else that left. I'm the one that left. You ever find yourself there? Our focus changes. Someone talked about Peter walking on that water until his eyes got off of Jesus, until he stopped focusing. That can happen to any of us. And if we're not careful, we can become desensitized to the darkness around us. And if we're not careful, we don't even recognize the light anymore. We just know our friends are gone. Where'd they go? Where are we? Back in the world. And friends, listen, please listen. If you don't return, and if you don't return soon, you could be forever lost fallen in those crevices of which there is no return. Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. You know, as long as you're in Christ, as long as you were in the sheepfold, the shepherd guided you around that rough terrain, around those bottomless crevices and the thorns and the thistles and all the things, that the, the danger that was there. While you were in the sheepfold, you had some protection. The shepherd saw to that. You had some kind of safety of the sheepfold. And you had the encouragement of the rest of the flock. But if we become desensitized to the darkness, we fail to recognize the light the shepherd offered. We fail to recognize the protection that he offered and the encouragement of the fold. But friends, you need to know there's hope. There can be tonight joy in heaven among the angels if we would have a heart that could be turned back to God. How could God ever forgive me? John said in 1 John 1 and verse 9, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The shepherd can cleanse us. The shepherd will open his arms. He'll pull you from whatever hole you find yourself in and he'll throw you over his shoulder and he'll bring you back home if you have the heart to repent. And oh, when you come home, oh, there's lots of joy around the sheepfold. Everybody's joyful. But can you even begin to... I can't begin to fathom the kind of joy the Bible talks about in heaven (laughs) by God and the shepherd who redeemed you in the first place and even the angels of heaven. Your very action could mean the difference. Another soul lost or joy in heaven when a sinner returns home. Isn't it interesting to me, Jesus told this parable about one who was lost and now found to the very people who would refuse to even recognize they were the lost. And in that condition, lost forever. What about us? 
bring joy in heaven when we acknowledge I'm lost and I need my shepherd.